Hi, everybody. I am Anja Annette, and welcome to this week's session of Healing from the Inside Out. And today I have an amazing guest with me. Alan is a communication specialist and a profiler internationally, and he's extremely well known. He's a leader in reading people and helping people grow their business. And really, um, you also started something called um, the Campfire Project, I believe. That's and right, we yeah. together. So tell me about yourself because what you do fascinates me. And we we do run in a, the same circles in a platform that we're on. So yeah. I'm just fascinated by the the people that are there coaching with us. So tell me yeah. about yourself. Well, as I said, on that platform, it's a really great platform with great people in there. But um, I'm a, uh, as you said, I'm a profiling and communication specialist. And what got me into doing that was the fact of a number of divorces or two divorces, a lot of broken relationships and even business partners who emptied the bank out. So uh, quite a number of years ago, a couple of decades ago, I decided I needed far better ways of reading people. And that led me to uh, becoming a profiler of uh, people. But my background, I live here in uh, Newcastle, which is north of Sydney, Australia. I'm a... Uh, grandfather of uh, six grandchildren and uh, uh, three sons. And the three sons I actually raised on my own from the age of four, 11 and 12. And uh, now I've got the uh, grandkids to be able to um, wind up and then send home to get payback on their fathers. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So what got you, I mean, I know what got you interested in it, but I, I've seen you in some videos so tell me a little bit more about what you do, because you can tell a lot by people. I mean, I'm a nurse for a really long time, mm. and I have to be able to read people's body language. So mm. um, I'm good at that. But I don't know that I would connect that with reading people so much, because there is so much you can learn by, from someone by what mm. they don't say, Do you know? So tell me how that works for you, how you read them. Well, first of all, there's the old saying that um, uh, you've always uh, taken more of it. You've got um, two eyes, two ears and one mouth and use them in that proportion. There's more information in the nonverbals than there are in the verbal information itself. As I say, when it comes to communication, we have the words, we have the tonality and we have the nonverbal, the body language, etc. The words are worth about 7%. The tone of voice is about 38% and the body language is 55. So that's when we can see somebody like I've got you on uh, Zoom here and I'm talking to you or if I've got uh, some, somebody in real life. But what we find is that um, on the phone, people say, well, you can't see the body language. The body language transfers into the tone of voice. So it's the not so much the actual words that are being used, but the way in which they've said and the way in which we say things reflects in our body as well. As they say, our neurology and physiology are linked all the time. So mm. what we feel inside, we express outwardly. And so I, for quite a, a number of decades, I was using body language to be able to read other people. When I was 23, I'd been put in charge of a group of men who were all older than me. My second in charge was 38, and all the other team members were between his age and mine. And so I had to get them on side. So I used body language in those days. And then... Uh, that was in the 70s and in the 80s, I got involved in psychometric profiling, you know, giving people questionnaires like Myers-Briggs and DISC and getting them to fill those questionnaires out to work out their personalities. But I realised that down the track that people don't tell the truth. You ask them a mm. question, they try to think, well, how do you see me? You know, how is the other person going to see me? What should I say here? So we answer things in that particular way. And then in the 90s, I got involved with NLP, neuro-linguistic neuro programming, the way in which we structure our questions to get the answers or the responses that we're looking to uh, get. And so I realized they were working okay together, but I was working with a company that um, brought me in because they taught currency trading and none of their students made any money. So they brought me in. And I realized that when we were putting people through the psychometric profiling tests, when they went live with their uh, trading, putting money on the table, they didn't match their profiles anymore. And I needed a better system to read them. And somebody said to me, you know, they're in about the early 2000s, said to me, you ever looked at reading faces? And that's when I got very interested in that. 
because I think it was um, one of your coaches over there in uh, America in UCLA called uh, John Wooten who had said the most important thing you'll ever learn is the next thing you learn after you think you know everything. And so mm -hmm. I've always had that attitude, open mind, learn as much as I can and then apply it and make sure that it works for me as well. So, you know, some things will work for other people, but what works for me? And I found that by bringing the you know, facial, um, uh, being able to read someone's face, the body language, the tone of voice, the questions we asked, et cetera. And I came up with a program that I created called Rapid Trait Profiling. So it's based on four sciences. We were looking at the body language, the uh, micro expressions, the little twitches on the face that tell us what somebody is really feeling in the, in the moment. And the way they happen is when something's said around you or something uh, is uh, uh, something happens or something is said, we, un we respond unconsciously. We naturally have a quick expression on our face, which can last as fast as a fifth of a second down to one twenty-fifth of a second. But in that moment, before our conscious mind steps in, it's given away what the person really feels. And so I worked with that. I worked with the body language. I'd worked with the NLP. How do we use the language to work, get responses, get somebody to into a state where they'll then respond with the body language and expressions to tell us the truth. But up front, I needed to know somebody's personality more than anything else, because that's the cornerstone of the foundations of everything we do. At the end of the day, the relationships we build are the, the foundation of all of our businesses, et cetera. And to build a strong relationship, we need to be able to communicate in the wrong, right way. And to communicate in the right way, we have to be able to understand the other person, to read them accurately. And I found the best thing to be able to do that, taking their emotions out of it, taking their um, education levels, their culture, their beliefs and everything else. I needed to be able to not just ask questions to get answers, but I needed to be able to pick something up where they, they didn't need their response. And I realized that looking at someone's face, their facial features tells me their personality. Now, for everybody who's listening to this, they're probably going to think, oh, this is a little bit clairvoyant, this mind reading. It's not. What it comes down to, if you lift weights, you build muscles in your body. So if you did a bicep curl, you'd build your biceps up. If depending on if you do it with your hand up or your hand facing down, you'll get a different structure. So the way we would move the muscles repetitively will create ridges and crevices on them. At the same time, everything we feel inside, we express outwardly. So while you're thinking and concentrating, you're going to pull expressions over and over. And these little vertical lines in here, for instance, the lines we get across here, the bulge, the bigger bulge above the eyebrows, mm -hmm. that all comes from working the muscles over and over. And so by working the muscles over and over, reflecting what we're feeling inside, there's a the face becomes a roadmap of um, how we like to think and process, which is our personality, not our character. It doesn't tell me whether a person's a good person or a bad person, because two people look very similar but their facial features will tell me they think in a similar way, but what they're thinking about can be totally different. One's thinking about how can I improve society and help other people, and they're really deeply concentrating and developing these lines, et cetera, or they're doing the same deep thinking about how they can rip somebody off for their own benefit. And so I uh, don't judge a book by uh, looking at the, uh, the face and saying, right, this is who that person is as far as character goes. I look at them, I know, well, this is how that person likes to be spoken to, how they like to be treated, and this is how they like to think and process information. So I know how to deliver it to them to build a relationship. And so that's where uh, the facial features came in. So facial features give me the personality. I then know how, where I am on the world scale compared to them. I change the way that I like to be spoken to to match the way they do, plus using questioning techniques to get to the truth of information. And then I've got the feedback from the body language and expressions that tell me, have I read them right? Is there something emotionally going on? And yes, are they telling me the truth? And that's now I've worked with the um, Disney films, Gillette, the Australian Federal Police, the tax office, businesses of all sizes and parents and school teachers. Wow. It's very interesting. Um, it You were talking about it being like exercising a muscle because you do have to exercise your mind to be more perceptive in that area. So with concentration, you get better at it. That's right. So what yes. you've got is you've got traits that you're born with. So what we call the nature traits. These are ones that are passed down in the DNA from your parents. So the basic structure. But we are a combination of how we've responded to all the events in our life. 
So our nurture traits, the ones that develop over time where our face changes structure, we get more uh, lines, et cetera, the corner of the mouth, if it really turns down, you got no, you've got somebody who's been frowning a lot through their life. They've been unhappy. So they're more likely to be pessimistic than optimistic. If you've got the mouth turning up, like a young child, you know they're going to be quite optimistic. They're, they're happy. They recover from things very quickly. And that muscle there, or the angle of the mouth, that can change by just starting to have a lot more fun and laughing. If your mouth's turned down, it starts to turn back up again. Because we're strengthening these muscles and shortening them, which at rest pulls the corner of the mouth up. And so we can change some of those as well. So we can actually look at our personality and go, okay, what areas do I want to change? And so we can change them by doing that repetitive um, a, 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 a attitude towards things. As far as I watch a lot more uh, move, uh, uh, comedies and things like that, I laugh at a lot, a lot more than I used to. And I did notice my corner of my mouth started turning up because I went through a lot of tough things when I was a kid. It was a fairly um, you know, tough uh, childhood. And so I didn't smile much and my face showed it. But now a lot of people tell me I look younger than what I did 10 years ago. So, well, <laughs> and that's well, because... laughter is good for the soul. There's no doubt in that. So you, you were talking about nurture, nature, and things that are really um, passed down by generations. So do you think these skill sets that we acquire, that we have, that they come from our genetic line? Is that what you mean? There's a basis to where we start with it. So if you're in a, um, uh, a family where very highly academic, et cetera, you know, well, I've got a couple of friends who are psychologists and their whole family have been psychologists for generations. We, we gravitate and we, uh, get, we spend time with people who are like us. And where we start with our own uh, behaviours are through the people that we were born with, that we hang around with. So our parents and our family, et cetera. So we create a change in our um, nurture traits by changing our environment, by changing the friends that we have. That's why I always say if you want to become rich, for instance, you'll hang around rich people. We are an average of the five uh, closest friends that we have. And so if you're hanging around people who are miserable, you're going to be miserable. And that's going to show on your face as well. If you want to change that, you need to get away from whatever drags you back into thinking the same way. So when I was a massage therapist and working with terminally ill patients, I used to, they'd come to me with their conditions and they would say, well, look, I don't like the way I'm thinking. And I would say to them, look, well, you can't change the way you're thinking by thinking about how you're thinking, because all you're going to do is get more of the same. But how would that make you feel? And they would tell me, well, I feel really lousy. I said, well, tell me how you would prefer to feel. And they would talk about that and all the things they'd like to do. And I go, okay, well, tell me, using all your senses, describe what it'd be like if you're doing that. If they said, well, I like walking down the beach, then I want to know, are they walking bare feet? Do they feel the sand under their, in their toes, the dry sands, the wet sand is in the water's edge? What can they smell and all the rest of it? Who are they talking to? What can they hear? And by bringing all the other senses in, we can't separate our neurology from our physiology. Whatever we feel inside, we express outwardly. And whatever we're feeling on the outside, we're going to feel inside as well. So by getting them thinking about and then talking about all these things that they'd be doing, they align their thoughts with their feelings. And all of a sudden now they've changed their thoughts altogether without having gone back to the original thoughts. And I found that one of the best ways to get people to get out of the ruts they were in and look at so, a different alternative. And in that state, I'd say, well, look, with the people you're hanging around, is that going to make it easier to continue thinking this new way? And they go, well, no. And so, well, then you need to change your friends. And so they would make those changes. And because they now have the, the changes with their new friends, they found it easier to repeat that behavior. And the more you repeated that, it became a belief and or behavior, first of all, a habit, a, a behavior, and then finally a belief. And so their whole lives changed. Well, I mean, there's a lot of psychologists that speak to that. Um, Shad Helmstetter made millions of dollars on his book, The Things We Say When We Talk to Ourselves. So mm -hmm. you can reshape your thinking. It is, you know, on um, neuroscience. So um, you can really... Um, reprogram so he based his life on reprogramming the brain and how to do that in your perception you know about what you think 
by changing your thoughts, you can change your life. So um, I'm a firm believer in that. And I, I adore him. I've read his books again and again and again. <laughs> um, so, yes. So I, I think there's a lot to that. It's like Pavlov and the dog, you know, um, you can really <laughs> re retrain anything. But how does this help you in, say, your business? Does it help you more to be more perceptive to their feelings and um, how to respond? Because you said that before, if I was listening correctly, you said before that you want to match your tone with theirs. Hmm. So you talk to them in a way that they need to be spoken to. Because if I may, looking at you, I know that you like to analyze things. You need more information before you make a decision. Where there are other people, they just want the least amount of information. They just want the, in the overview. So you will probably experience in your life, sometimes you've been talking to somebody and everything's been going fine, but all of a sudden they seem to have switched off and you don't know why. That is because they will have just wanted less information than you. You've already given them that. They've already been ready to make their decision, but you're still giving them more information. So if you know that, you know how to talk to that piece, person. If I've got someone who is just wants the least amount of information and I've got something that's got a lot of information there, I'm going to say to them, look, I'm, what I'm, there's a lot of information here, but what I'm going to do is just give you the overview. You can then ask all the questions that you need to ask to be able to make your decision. But if there's something there that I think you need to know that you didn't ask about, is it all right if I tell you that then? The answer to that will always be yes, because the person knows we're going to have a conversation. I'm not going to be talking at them. I'm going to be having a discussion. So I give them the overview. I then ask them, well, what questions have you got? They ask the questions that they need to ask. And then I, if there's nothing else I need to share with them, fine. But if there is, I go, well, remember when I started, the, I said there might be something there that uh, you needed to know that uh, you didn't ask. That boring stuff, we're there now. You know, is that okay? And I usually <laughs> get a giggle from them. And I explain it to them because we'll say I was a financial uh, planner and I had to tick all the boxes on the computer. That would be the stuff they probably wouldn't have asked about. So I've instead of giving them all that and bombarding them with all this information, I've been able to just give them an overview, the least amount of information, like just link like a, what do you call it? The, um, uh, a, um, oh, I can't even think of it at the moment. Um, anyway, I'll come back to it, but just the at least amount of information, like a, like a rainbow, just from here to here, there's the beginning, there's the end, et cetera, the information in between, what more do you need to know about it? And then they ask those questions. So it be, while they're asking me, asking me the questions, we're having a conversation. But an analytical person, what they normally try to do is just give them all the information. They don't give them the overview. They give them this bit and they go deep on that. They give them the next bit and they go deep on that. And the person's going, hang on. They'll either turn switch off or they try and answer your question, like answer your sentences before you finish them because they just want to get through it quickly. I analyze. I personally, ana I personally analyze things for my own life, but I don't speak to people in an analytic way because I'm taught to think critical on my feet. I have seconds to make a decision, so I can't sit there and analyze things like yeah. that. And I have spoken to people like that, and it's very difficult to have that conversation. Yeah, because they want it's too much information and I yeah. shut down after a few seconds. So I, yeah, well, I do get you, that. The other thing is with you, there's also what I call physical motive, which is driven by action. And that is be able to give me the best way to do it, then get out of the way and let me get it done. So when oh, it comes me. to analyzing the information and making sure you got that right, as soon as you got the amount you need, that's okay. Stop talking, get out of the way, let me get the job done. Because it's not just one trait that defines us, but it's a combination of all the traits together. And each trait will kick in at different times. Every trait has an upside and every trait has a downside. See, what if, it, if I gave you a project to go and research everything and come up with the best way to do things, that would probably be something that you'd be trying to rush through to get to the action point quickly. But there'll be somebody else who has the opposite trait, who has what I call a mental motive, who is somebody who is motivated by the thought processes. They like to think about all the different possibilities. Well, that person I'd give the job to to go and create and work out which is the best way to do it. 
then I'd bring it back. They'd get them to bring it back and give it to someone like you who's got the physical motive to go and get the job done. So together they work very well as a team. But if they don't understand each other's traits and they're trying to put something together together, what they're going to do then is clash. So this is where this comes in. So whether it be to build your teams or whether it be in sales, for instance, because I know if there's, uh, if you know, you'd come to me and I'm talking to you about a financial prospect, you're going to want all the information to make sure you've got the right, you make your decision. So you want to get it as quickly as you can so you can move on. But if I just gave you the least amount of information, just the overview, you'd be interrupting me and asking me for more information about the particular things that we're talking on. So straight away, I know that I need to deliver it to you in a different way. And so that's where this comes in, first of all. So if you're doing presentations, perfect for that. When it comes to uh, partners, for instance, the difference in our traits will be the thing that attracted us in the first place. But once we get used to the that side of the traits, then we notice the other side and then we start to have clashes in our relationships. So knowing the other person's traits and knowing how to talk to them, we can keep the spice in our relationships a lot longer as well. So virtually where I can use these traits is understanding a young child and knowing what hobbies and sports will suit them. While I, tell you, I can tell you what they're going to be like when they go to school, whether they're going to fit, uh, fit that particular school system or not. As they go through their studies, we know what uh, careers will suit their personality so we can put them in the right directions for the right studies. They're, that way, then when they go on, if they want to go into university to learn, do a degree, for instance, they're more likely to continue with the degree and go into the workplace and work in that field. If they change employees, employers, it'll be to get a better place to work. It'll be for promotion or moving up through the ranks, not likely to be a change from one career to another career to another career. Because how many people do a university degree and even have multiple per, uh, degrees and never work in that field? Because they went into it because they were told this is a great uh, field to be in. They do their studies and they go, no, this is not for me. So if we're able to pick that up at school, we can guide them in the right direction. It saves them a, a lot of time uh, finding the right career. It saves a lot of uh, time on the expenses as well on uh, the degrees itself. How many, times, there, right how many times have you been in that situation? I mean, do you hear from people years later saying that your help has transformed their life in in those school days, the things that you were able to intervene on based on your perception of what they'd be good at? Yeah, well, also on the uh, the way in which the parents and the teachers needed to talk to the children as well, educating them. Uh, the record I've got at the moment, I've got one lady who is still, one mother who is still doing testimonials for me 14 years after I profiled her six-year-old son, and he's now 20. Wow. The impact it had on their life. But it wasn't just uh, how um, what studies and things he should do at school. The problem originally was he has Asperger. And neither the school nor the after school was what, uh, care wanted him anymore. They wanted him medicated. And so by being able to profile him and teaching the parents and the teachers on how to talk to him and treat him, uh, medication was off the table. And he was back in the regular part of the school and his whole life changed completely. Where they said he never would do uh, presentations in front of the class when he was six years old, uh, at seven, he was in front of the class doing presentations. And the psychologists, they let the psychologists go a couple of, another year later because they didn't need him anymore. And doctor's approval, uh, you yeah, know, drugs were not on the uh, the agenda anymore. And so this, it affects every part of our lives. And that's a good thing about it. So it doesn't matter at what point you bring it into somebody's life, it will affect them from there on. And this is one of the things I don't know of anybody else how, who has as many clients as I have who are still doing testimonials many years after I've worked with them. Okay, so where can people find you? Because you do do the campfire. You can you do do the campfire. You are involved in other things. What is the best way that people can contact you? Well, the best way is through my website than anything else, because it's one thing that I'll always be using. The way things are going, I'm moving away from Facebook and LinkedIn uh, to this other platform. And... Uh, so the, um, my website's the best one, and it's easy to find. It's just my name, which is Alan Stevens, A-L-A-N, and Stevens, S-T-E-V-E-N-S, dot com, dot A-U for Australia. They can find me on there. That will then link to other things like the Campfire Project, 
from the Campfire Project. It's a safe place for men and women from around the world to be able to come together and share their stories. And this is where people have come in there to tell stories they've never had the courage to tell anybody else before. But because of my profiling skills, they've opened up within minutes and talked for you know, well over an hour and that about their past. So it's been a safe place for men and women to come and share their stories and then join in discussions. We're in a place where we've had no bigotry, sexism or racism uh, in over 600 hours of conversations in uh, almost six years now. So we're doing something dramatically uh, impressive in there. Plus that's been went on to the Business of Smiles, which is a, uh, a, a, a charity in the area of mental health. And besides that, because I'm involved with schools, I'm also a, um, a board member on one of the Montessori primary schools here as well. So all this stuff, bringing it together, all based on my profile and to be able to link all these different groups and help them right across um, all areas of life. You told me about the, the campfire um, project before. We we had another conversation about that. Mm. We are going to have to get a little more into that on another show, though, <laughs> because you are in you are multifaceted. Alan, you need you need a few shows. So you do have your own show too, don't you? Well, I, I do um, uh, with the interviews through the Campfire Project. I also uh, interview people in the business side of things as well, because as I say, um, my whole business is based on relationships. When people come, it might be a, a a mortgage broker, for instance. Well, I want to know about the human connection of their business. If they happen to be a coach, what's the human side of that? Doesn't matter what field they're in. And we talk about the services they offer, but also you know, why they do what they do. Because at the end of the day, I can come on here and talk about all the stuff I do, but how do people know whether I'm somebody that they really want to work with? They need to know my why. And that's why I interview people to find out their why. Why mm -hmm. are they passionate about what they do? Why do they want to help people? You know, I'm in my 70s now. I've got no intention of ever retiring. And if I wasn't running my business, I'd still be working with the Campfire Project, the Business of Smiles and the, and this, the, the, high, the Montessori Primary School because I've got a passion to see a change in society. And the best way I can do that is through my profile to make those connections. <laughs> we desperately need a change. Well, we, we do have to close this out. So if you could share one insight that you would think that would give the audience the most um the biggest takeaway from this what would that be well I always remind people and that first of all is being right in your in yourself because everything comes from you knowing yourself and being comfortable with yourself you've got to love yourself before you can love other people you've got to respect yourself before you can respect anybody else so in that one thing I've learned a long time ago is there's an old saying what you do for yourself dies with you but what you do for others and for the community isn't always will be eternal. And in fact, the more you help other people, as they say, you can't light someone else's path without lighting your own. And so by having that approach to life, to, to be of service, not a servant, I don't believe in being a servant leader. I'm a serving leader, completely different thing. Because as a servant, I can't lead if I'm a servant. But if I'm serving, I can lead. And that's the best way I look at things. How do I lead and help other people? Because when I do that, it enriches my life. Correct. At the same time. I've been in service my whole life, so I totally get that. I want to thank you for coming on today. I think what you do is fascinating, and I loved listening to, listening to what you do and your take on these things. I enjoy listening to other people's perspectives and how mm -hmm. they help, and I think it helps me grow in, in a lot of ways Absolutely. as well. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing this with my audience. And I want to thank the audience for coming in and our special guest, Alan Stevens, and have a good night. Take care. Thank you very much.